Welcome to On Your Own Terms. I'm Patty Talbot, and this is the place where we learn together what it takes to change the world on our own terms and in our own special ways. I'm really excited about today's episode because our guest is speaking on a topic that flows perfectly from last week's conversation with Kat O'Sullivan. You'll remember that Kat talked about how to make the seemingly impossible possible in our lives. Well, this week's guest, Catherine Shrinker, has done that in a really big and powerful way. It took some time and it took some trust in the universe. You will not want to miss Catherine's Homegrown Solutions for a Patchwork World. She is the Executive Director of the Wayne C. Henderson School of Appalachian Arts. You'll learn what that means more as we go along, but I first want to tell you how I was fortunate to meet Catherine because we are new friends and introduced through my husband who loves the Wayne C. Henderson School of Appalachian Arts and has been involved with them for several years. I want to point that out to you today because I want to remind you that I get referrals for change-making women in the world from everywhere, from my own family, from my own friends, from people I've never heard of before and never met. What I'm on the lookout for is people like the guests that you've seen on this show, women who are changing the world on their own terms. I always ask them to tell us about what I sometimes also call their beingness, their doingness, their connectingness, and their reflectiveness, because these are the four corners of the Change Makers Journey Framework. This week's guest is Catherine Shrinker, and she... corn-fed girl from Indiana, and I was raised in a large Catholic family, five kids. I'm number four out of five, which most people that are raised in Catholic families usually say the number. If you've ever heard Jim Gaffigan, (laughs) he always talks about that. But I had a very wonderful upbringing, a little bit unusual. My mom was a very creative person. She was an Aquarius. And my dad was a very staunch German. She was Irish Catholic. And so I was always raised with a metaphysical balance to my growing up. So the very strict Catholic, I went to Catholic school for eight years and I taught at Notre Dame for 10. We would always go to mass, you know, every day because you went to Catholic school. But on Sunday, dad would make sure we went to mass. And then in the afternoons, my mom would haul us off to a spiritualist camp. So what was so wonderful with that upbringing was that I was always taught in Catholic school that Catholic meant universal. So I was raised with all of these different ideals, not just Catholic but Hindu, Buddhist, spiritualist, Jewish, Baptist, the whole range. And of course, Anderson, Indiana, where I was born, was Church of God. So I had a lot of friends that were very much into that strict dogma because they didn't believe in singing, dancing, smoking, drink, you know, any of that. Of course, the Catholics were everything but that. As a child, I would sit in church. And when I'd sit in mass, I'd look at the stained glass windows and I would see all these beautiful colored images of people. And that's how I've always seen people. I've always seen their energy field and the aura and the energy around them. And I didn't realize until I was in college I went to study art. I always wanted to do music, which is interesting because I run a music and craft nonprofit now. Whenever I would practice, the instrument that I was practicing on would disappear (laughs) because I practiced all the time. So it was substituted with pencil and paper because you didn't hear that. It was quiet. I learned to draw and consequently went into fine art and graphic design. And it was in one of my painting classes where we did things that are called round robin, where you would sit on a drawing horse for four or five minutes and then the buzzer would go and you'd move to the next bench. 
and we were going around and I was drawing like we, it was live drawing. So there was a model there and I'm drawing all this color and all this stuff around this model. And finally, somebody said, who's drawing this weird stuff? <laughs> you know, and I got real quiet. I'm like, what? They don't see that? Because when do you have that discussion? You never have that discussion in your life with someone. How do you see people? You just don't. It never dawned on me that other people didn't see people that way because growing up going to church every day, you, you see the halos and the aura. You just I just thought that's how p- people saw people. That led to my research when I started a career in graphic design to understand color and color and people and color and energy. I had a more academic approach to it because I taught at Indiana University and then I taught at Notre Dame. So I wanted to understand the subliminal use of color in human behavior and why people reacted the way they did to color. also led me to get a certification in hypnosis because that's what hypnosis is, is understanding the subconscious suggestions. And I could understand marketing and advertising and all of that. So that's kind of how my journey started, which ultimately ended me up here in Southwest Virginia, where I co-founded a clinic called Integrated Health Concepts with my brother. I left Notre Dame. I le- I got out of academia in 2000, 2001 is when I left Notre Dame. And I moved down to Bristol, Tennessee and co-founded Integrated Health Concepts with my brother, Dr. Jim Shrinker. And that clinic actually still is booming today. He's He has patients from like five states all over that come to understand integrated health medicine. And my work there was to look at people and look at their energy and their color and what was around them. And I was able to discern what was going on within their bodies medically based on the different energy fields and the different color. It's called a medical intuitive. And so that brought me down here and I worked with that Then with that journey, I decided to leave the clinic in, I laugh and say, what kind of psychic am I? Because I left in 2008 (laughs) when everything just kind of went boom, but I kept things going. And in order to have an intuitive practice, you have to travel and, and do podcasts and travel and do workshops. And I had all kinds of different workshops on how to recognize your intuition, art and spirituality, hypnosis, everything I did. And I loved it. But as life would happen, my daughter in 2012 graduated from high school and I still had a younger son. I couldn't travel anymore. She went off to college. And just trying to make things work in 2012, I had to get a job. Uh, I was overqualified for everything. I couldn't get a job. I had what I call my magic refrigerator, which is a whole nother show (laughs) on manifesting. The magic refrigerator, which is your vision board. And I always tell clients to use your refrigerator instead of a journal or an actual vision board, because how many times do you go to the refrigerator? You want to put images and symbols of where you want your life to go on that refrigerator. And I had everything on my magic refrigerator that I wanted. At the time I was seeing an individual, a man named Tom. So I had Tom on there. I didn't have his picture, but I had Tom, T-O-M. I had a house with a pond, 300 acres. I had a Silverado. I had all this stuff that I I wanted to work toward. Meanwhile, I can't find a job. I take my magic refrigerator and just say, forget it. Take it down. I have what I call my Lieutenant Dan meltdown. If anybody's ever seen the movie Forrest Gump, where you're up swinging and you're yelling at God and say, "If if I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, why isn't it easy? Well, life's not easy. 
But the big realization is going through hard times wasn't necessarily about me. You always think it's about you, but when you're a parent and you're a mother, sometimes those lessons are for those kids to learn. You know, they need to learn that we still talk about the best Christmas we ever had. We didn't have any money. I was divorced, three kids, trying to put food on the table at a minimum wage job, which by the way, you cannot. So I don't care who says it, you can't. And I'm thinking I'm being punished. Well, I wasn't being punished. My kids had to go through that in order to learn compassion and empathy. And those stories could go on endless. What we all learned, but the most important was, one, it's not always about me. And two, sometimes the greatest gift you can give to people is to allow them to help you. And when you're in that point in your life where you're always used to helping people, and I'll say it now, I like being on the other end. (laughs) I like being this secret Santa's elves and all of that instead of putting the name in so my kids can get something for Christmas. So, and there were a lot of people that said, you're an educated woman. I don't believe your story. The system is meant to keep people down, particularly women. You know, and to be a woman of color, I know is even harder. And they were like, oh, you know, there's all these loans out there for women and that. Well, yeah, but when you've got cigar toting men or the ones that are the end of the line to to give that grant money and don't give it, I tried to get a business loan. I ended up with my Lieutenant Dan meltdown saying, I need something. I need change. I need something fast. I need it now. I need a job. Ugh. And I had my truck and I was getting the oil changed in it. I was there and one of the men came in and said, Kat, you need an air filter. And I said, Larry, what I need is a job. And he's like, you want to work here? And I'm like, Larry, you don't tease me. I said, And so what I did, instead of dropping off resumes, I started filling out applications. Big difference. You just put down what you're qualified to do that job. So I work custodial and cafeteria jobs to put myself through school. That's what I put down on my application. And they hired me. And the irony of it is, is the place was called Fast Change. And I was hired on November 11th, 2011. So those that know me, I'm into numerology and that's an 11, 11, 11. And 11 is a gateway, two ones, which passing through that gateway. And my oil was getting changed at 11, 11 a.m. So I was like, okay, I got to take this job because that is the sign that that is what I need, that 11, that gateway. And it was, it wasn't the end all, but it was following my heart and the guidance to get me where I am today. And I couldn't have gotten here any other way. And I couldn't have gotten here any quicker. I call it a God minute. That defines a God minute. You think it, it's the reason why you had to go through what you go through you find out that answer and that answer is in that God minute because the universe has to line people up. It can't just shove everybody together. Once that happens, boom. And so I went from that of which it was interesting because my oldest son said, mom, you know, you were a college professor. What are you doing changing oil in cars? And I said, son, it's all about perception. The way I see it, they're paying me $7.50 an hour to learn everything I can about a car. And I did. And that's how I took that opportunity of you don't look at it as a minimum wage job. You look at it and you say, wow, this is what I can learn from this job. And I'm getting paid for it. It's a paid education if you approach it right. So then from that job I was hired on, we would change the oil and rotate tires to a company called Abingdon Ambulance, which was a Medicaid cab. Oh my God, I love that job. 
if that job paid, I would still be doing it. With that job, I learned about Appalachia. Even though I'd lived down here 10 years, I've been down here almost 20 now. Um, I learned parts and the people of this region that people that have grown up here don't even know. Back in the haulers, Russell County, Lee County. And when you're with somebody for three hours in a car, if you ask the right questions, which you know, you, you are wealthy. I mean, you learn so much. So I look back now in those two jobs, I could have looked at as punishment or my journey, my life is over. And I did get deep, dark, depressed. It's, it's tough. But I look back now and I learned everything about running a business from fast change, from inventory to cash register, to all the stuff that I never learned being a professor because you don't learn that, to everything about Appalachia and the people and how resourceful and wonderful and rich they are in culture and everything else. And how you never make a joke about a toothless person because it's the system that does it. They don't do it to themselves. Medicaid will pay to have all your teeth pulled, but they won't pay for dental care and they won't pay for dentures. But by gosh, those dentists will pull every tooth for every dollar they can. And the same thing about trash building up on their porches. Well, no neighbor's going to offer to haul your trash off and there's no trash pickup. And if you're working two jobs, who has time? So a whole lot of understanding and empathy came from that. And also meeting a lot of different people because I drove the cab. I'd have a couple of hours to kill time or whatever. And it set the foundation for the Henderson and understanding how to run a nonprofit because I knew how to run a business understanding the people because I was immersed within that culture above and beyond what anybody would have. And it just made a difference. And then the magic refrigerator comes back. So I'm driving this Medicaid cab. I meet this wonderful person who owns a gallery in Abingdon. I walk in and start talking to him. His name was Dean Barr. He still has a gallery. He talked me into doing a show. And I said, I've never done a show. I'm not talented enough. He said, you are. He said, you need to do so. I had time to do watercolors because I worked a 40 hour a week job. He got my bio and he read my bio for this show. And he said, he goes, there's a job in Marion, Virginia. And he said, he goes, I swear, Catherine, they must have written the job description based on your bio. And I said, oh, yeah, they probably already hired the cousin of the mayor. I'm not even going to try. I'm done. I was just going to do my watercolors and drive a Medicaid cab. And that was going to be my life. I was done. He said, no, no, I know they're, they're different than that. You need to apply. And I said, no, no, this would be a dream job for me in Southwest Virginia. I mean, a, just a dream job. I said, okay, I'll do it. So I did it. 48 hours later, I get a rejection letter. And for the first time in my life, I got mad. I didn't say, oh, it's the universe giving me guidance or this job's not for me. I knew in my heart that everything I had done had led me to here. And I came over and I ran, first person I ran into was the mayor. And I just said, sir, I'm going to be your new schoolhouse director. And he's like, oh, really? And I said, yes, as soon as you can point me to Ken Heath's office, and I can tell that person he's making the biggest mistake of his life. And the mayor goes, well, I'd kind of like to see that. And I said, sir, you are welcome to come along. But you know what you're going to do? Take away my birthday? They had already told me I didn't have the job. But I had never had the gumption to do anything like that in my life ever. But it was like, you know what? I'm, I'm going for it. Went in, shook Ken Heath's hand, and I said, 
you're making a big mistake. I go, I can make that place sing. That place will be something you've never even dreamed it could be. I go, it's not about the money and it's not a stair step job. I'm not going to get my experience and move. I said, my kids are, are raised here and this is where I want to stay. I, I love this. This is my own. 24 hours later, they called me in for an interview and, and they hired me. And that was nine years ago. And we laugh because they always say, you know, they always argue about who hired me. And I say, I hired me. And now full circle back around to my magic refrigerator and the universe needing time to line things up. So at the time I had had T-O-M, Tom, because I was dating this person. And after five years, we broke up, which devastated me. I never had a broken, even in my divorce, I never had a broken heart. And I know there's a lot of people that don't understand that. My heart was broken, all of that. Forget my 300 acres and my house with a waterfall and all this stuff. So one of the requirements for me to take this job is I had to move from Washington County to Smith County. And I was like, well, unless you guys can make that happen for me, it's not going to happen for three years because I'm not going to get a bank loan until I've had this job at least that long. The town manager said, I've got this little house. It's a rental. If you can wait till February, he said, it's not great, but it used to be great. And I'm sure it could be beautiful again. We'll make a deal. You can do rent to own. Oh, by the way, the town of Marion, which by the way, is the initials T-O-M, which all my contracts said T-O-M. The town of Marion owns 300 acres behind that. And it's all in a conservancy. And, you know, there's a nice little pond. There's all kinds of streams. It's, just, it's the town's watershed. There's a big barn the town owns, but you can use it. So I had everything that was on my refrigerator and the conditions of getting it were nothing that you could dream of. So that's why it's important to set those symbols and those images in place, but never, ever put conditions on how you're going to get them. Don't think the only way I'm going to get this is to win the lottery because really, really tasking the universe with that. Or the only way I'm going to get this is to marry wealthy or to do this or to do that. So every contract that I sign was T-O-M, Town of Marion. Every day I log in, T-O-M, Town of Marion, Wi-Fi. It's so amazing that things manifest and put themselves where you need to be when you put your order in. And even when you take your order down, but all those emotions, I started this school I've had the most wonderful support from the town. I'm a town employee with state retirement, all of that under community and economic development. And I run the nonprofit. We do, of course, the guitar building, which was another thing that we manifested from nothing. I mean, everything that has taken place here at the Henderson has been created from nothing. Because you have to have that vision in order to build. You can't build without a vision and without a dream. And we have everything here from pottery to letterpress to the guitar making, the fiddle butt making, quilting, everything just building one program at a time. Once I get a program, self-sustainable with people that I can trust, I can move on to another program that's important to me. So the next program that is very near and dear to my heart that we're in about two months now, a recovery program for the arts and craft to offer a place for those in recovery to have a stigma-free creative outlet. And, and it started out being modeled after the Appalachian Arts Center in Hinman, Kentucky, which was leveled with that flooding last spring. We have a phenomenal letterpress 
which is a program I would really love to get up and going with the recovery because they need a voice and they need affirmations and they need hope and how to instill a direction in their life. And the reason you flounder is because you have no hope. It's the same thing for any woman out there that thinks there's no way out. Well, the first way out is to think your way out because thoughts are living things. And once you have that thought, then the actions and the motivations follow. When you have that thought and you couple it with emotion, we're walking magnets. And that's what attracts opportunity and people to us is when we turn it on. And that's why creativity and craft is so important. And that's why I have found the Henderson here, when people walk in, they don't want to leave because it is such a wonderful anchor of creativity, emotions, thought. They feel they have a purpose when they're here. Even if it's just to come in for a tour, there's just something about this place that's magical. I believe that's part of it. Um, I live in a little community that's progressive enough that is like, you know, okay, if You want to sponsor recovery court meetings here once a week, go for it. This community needs something. And that'll be a program. Hopefully I can get it up and and can function on its own. And then I'll move on to something else. Contact me through the school, through thehenderson.org. And that is my cell phone that is on the website. If they wanted a little information about what I was talking about with the life lesson numbers and guides, then katherineshrinker.com has a few blogs up. I'm just getting that up and going. And that's personal. That's to help with those that are in recovery and those that are just seeking some spiritual guidance. Beautiful. Thank you, Catherine. I know that our audience has been inspired by your story that has had some ups and downs, but because of who you are as a change maker, even the parts of life that haven't been as easy, you've looked at as part of your journey, learning what the universe has to teach you. Look at where you are now, making the world a better place in your own special way by bringing people music, bringing people stories, bringing people your special gifts of intuition, and even turning what might be a surprising small town into a place that can embrace alternative ways of thinking. So I know you'll want to look, Catherine, up at the places that she said, you may be interested in your numerology, you may be interested in your colors. And if you'll look on her website, you'll see the special intuitive practices and gifts that she brings to helping people understand themselves and their own life journeys. It's a journey I'm excited to be on. And I'm excited today that you got to meet such a powerful change maker doing work down the road, not too very far from me, in the town of Marion, Tom in Virginia. I love that story. When I hear that name, Tom, I will never think of it the same way again. I hope you'll get in touch and follow what's going on at the Wayne C. Henderson School of Appalachian Arts. I also hope you'll look up Katherine Shrinker's work because she does do individual coaching and consulting in some very unique and powerful ways. I hope you'll also follow my work at blueroadseducation.org. If you go to my website there, you'll be able to find lots of opportunities to get involved with Changemaker U, Y-O-U. There's a free ebook you can download that will help you get in touch with the 16 attributes that all change makers have in common. You can see that Catherine's got them. And when you read the book, you'll be able to find out where you have them and where you might build upon them as well. 
You can also find opportunities to get involved through our coursework that develops those 16 skills for change makers, as well as change maker circles. I'm also right now launching my coaching program in women's empowerment. This week, in fact, I've finished up the qualifications to be a certified women's empowerment coach with one of many women, a powerful and amazing organization that helps women find their power and show up in their power and overcome all of those things that might be dragging us down, overwhelming and burning us out. I look forward to introducing you next week to another woman changing the world on her own terms. And in the meantime, may you be grounded in your beingness, guided in your doingness, generous in your connectedness, and inspired in your reflectiveness so you can change the world on your own terms. I'm Patty Talbot. I'm always learning, and I know you are too. Um,